The island of Portland provides one of the most dramatic coastlines in England. A block of limestone, tethered to the mainland only by the mighty Chesil Bank. Its historic isolation and unique character make this story all the more remarkable. Pleased to meet you, Stuart. Phew, that was some steep climb. Yes, I used to get up there very much quicker when I was a boy. This is a super vantage point to see some of the uh, features of Church Oak. Have you always lived on the island? Yes, apart from a short spell in the 1960s, yes, I have. I was born here. Mm. You've written books about Portland. And what's your connection with the island? Well, I have family connections going back generations, if not centuries, in fact, particularly uh, on my paternal grandmother's side. Uh, she was born and bred on Portland, and uh, so were her forebears. And it was her that gave me uh, a lot of the information and enthusiasm for the history of the place and, and the general environment of Portland. In ancient times, for the defense of the island against attack, taxes were raised to build the first castle of any significance here. It was built on a pinnacle of rock high above Church Oak Cove, on the site of an earlier Saxon defence work. The workmanship displayed in the close-cut stone shows that the art of quarrying and masonry had been well mastered by the 14th century. Well, Rufus Castle here is uh, in a fairly sorry state at the moment. It's uh, survived on this site, obviously, for upwards of 600 years, and yet we've seen some pretty serious damage occurring just in the recent times and uh, English Heritage are proposing to do a restoration or at least a consolidation scheme on it and uh, I would say not before time. Every age has left its mark. Portland's recorded history goes back 1500 years but excavation work has given us tantalizing glimpses of far earlier inhabitants. Until the 19th century, instead of the great array of quarries you see now, the plateau of Top Hill was an expanse of fields. There were a few tiny watercourses running through depressions, too shallow to be called valleys, towards the English Channel beyond. These watering places attracted the first settlements, and Portland has among the most positive evidence of the presence of Stone Age man to be found in England. And while there are a few traces of Paleolithic man, there is much more evidence of the Middle Stone Age, where an enormous amount of material has been found at Culverwell, at the Mesolithic site near Portland Bill. It is, in fact, the um, only site known in England where we can get a complete picture about how people of the Mesolithic or Middle Stone Age really lived how they were the beginning of all these people who started the lynchets, who started farming, who started all these lovely villages on the island and elsewhere. So that we can see here almost in 
embryonic form the beginning of settlement, not only on the island, I should stress that, Carver Well is of international importance. And I regard that as the greatest achievement of my 33 years of working here. Within the museum, we have a number of artifacts which show that uh, man has been living continuously on the island since those early days. We have iron ingots. These are fairly unique and were probably used uh, as currency during that age. There is also evidence of a fairly large uh, Romano-British occupation on the island. Uh, this is indicated with the skulls, uh, the amount of burnished black Roman pottery which we have, and the numbers of red glaze dishes and Samianware dishes. It was probably the Romans who built the first ponds and wells from the springs on the steep hillside. Around these wells, the first real hamlets grew, their names having been passed down to us, like Fortune's Well and Maiden Well, along with Malham's and Chisel. These small hamlets, for centuries separate communities, blended into the dense array of the buildings below during the great influx of the 19th century. The early villages at Top Hill also grew around natural water sources, such as Wakeham, Reform, Weston, and Southwell. After the Romans withdrew in the 4th century, the south coast fell to the Saxon raiders. These new settlers introduced a revolutionary agricultural village system, which was to shape the Portland landscape and affect its life right up to modern times. It was the Saxons who established the manor of Portland, with the King of Wessex as its lord. They had a more lasting effect on Portland's customary life than any other regime. To govern all local affairs, manorial courts were established. The courts, leet and baron, as they became known, were set up throughout the land. This court leet was a direct link between the people and the crown, as this was a royal manor. Portlanders never answered to barons or earls. Their status was indeed special, and the Portlanders knew it. William II introduced a local land tax to help fund the building of defences, including church ope. The amount was raised by the king every year from tenants of the manor. In return, this quit the inhabitants from liability for service to the lord and was always known as the quit rent. The reeve, a local landowner, would collect the quit rent around the island recording payments by notches on his reef staff. This continued right up until 1935. The ancient court lead has survived uniquely with legal powers to this day. One colourful duty of the court lead is to beat the bounds every seven years, some four miles along Chesil Beach. Believe your only son, Jesus Christ, has ascended into the heavens. We pray that we also in heart and mind may also ascend, that we may come to dwell with him in all eternity. For he lives with you. The boundary stone marks the only point where the royal manor of Portland touches the mainland. And it is here where this ceremony is still carried out. Farming and fishing through the Middle Ages were the staple industries for the people of Portland right up to modern times. One time, 
no less than 900 sheep of a special breed grazed the islands, and these became a prized commodity. Portland mutton was regarded as the best in the land and graced many a royal table. Small flocks of this rare breed can still be seen around the island. Corn and other crops were harvested in the shallow but productive soil right across Top Hill. Grain was taken to the two windmills on high ground between Wakeham and Weston. Right until the 20th century, the Top Hill landscape was pastoral, as yet untouched by the quarries, which were still confined to around the coast. This must be one of the most romantic settings on the island. The ancient church, which gave Church Ope its name, was the main meeting place for islanders for 500 years. The old church was rebuilt about 1300 with a bell tower curiously separated from the main building by a one metre gap. For centuries, France was the country's enemy. Portland bore the brunt of numerous raids and skirmishes from across the Channel, as in the spring of 1404, when the French swept Portland with fire installed, damaging the old church so badly that it had to be rebuilt. It was then rededicated to St Andrew in 1475. By the early 16th century, the sheltered waters of Portland roads provided vital refuge for the Navy and merchantmen but they were plagued by French privateers and other pirates. Captain the guard, fire! Around 1538, Henry VIII ordered the building of Portland Castle, which displays the impeccable work of the Tudor masons and the lesser known skill of the quarry selectors. Today, Portland Castle remains in remarkable condition for its four and a half centuries. Before the castle was 50 years old, the attention turned to the growing menace from Spain. The Armada was expected, and in 1588, the castle was stocked up with ordnance and men. The ensuing Battle of Portland in July of that year, one of the great engagements between the Spanish Armada and the English fleet, was witnessed by Portlanders lining the clifftops. The battle itself may not have been decisive, but it stands in the annals of British history. Joan called me over and said she was interested in this Elizabethan thing that they were going to do around the castle, and was I interested in doing any sewing? So I said yes, and that's how it started, and I really got in at the deep end. We'd no materials, we'd no patterns, we'd no pictures, we'd nothing. So we had to go scouting round, trying to find ideas. We got a pair of old curtains given to us, and we used those to make this, do you remember? Yep. They'd been turned down at a jumble sale. I think we made about eight or nine outfits all together. Uh, men's and ladies, yes, and hats children's. and children's. How goes the game? Don't make my Sounds more like our cooks cooking than uh, playing a game. Yes, the English Civil War demonstrated Portland's outstanding loyalty to the Crown, 
when the royal manor and its castle were taken and retaken by the Roundheads, and, as a consequence, Portland suffered tremendous damage. Treatment by Cromwell's troops was harsh. Among the buildings they destroyed was what had been far and away the island's finest building, which stood on this site, the vicar's house at Wakeham, where a priceless library of manuscripts was burnt. For their loyalty, when Charles II was restored to the throne, Portlanders were given special privileges and a grant of money for every tonne of stone taken from Crown lands. This royal grant fund has been renewed by monarchs to this day. Through this time, Stone quarrying was nibbling away at the cliff edges, but it was not yet the major industry it was to become. An event far away in London in 1619 was to change the island's fortunes and indeed its shape forever. That was the year that the old banqueting house was burnt down. Inigo Jones, the royal surveyor, selected Portland Stone for use in the new building. And the three-year contract that followed paid for new roads and stone shipping piers under East Weirs. Jones's masterpiece proved the worth of Portland Stone as the perfect building material for the capital. And when, 45 years later, Christopher Wren was commissioned to rebuild St Paul's Cathedral after the Great Fire of London, his choice of Portland Stone was perhaps inevitable. That great project and the building of the other 50 Wren churches around London involved a massive effort and undertaking on this small island. Without Portlanders' expertise and cooperation, the cathedral could not have been completed. The island's major stone industry was now well and truly established. But winning stone away from the cliffs was becoming increasingly difficult. The problem of disposing of the waste became acute. Tracks and cuttings were made, and the overburden was trucked to the cliff edge. Retired quarrymen still take pride in explaining the old methods to Portland's many visitors. If the stone is tight up under the other rock, you can't cut it, you see, it won't cut. Uh, but this is how you do it. You might have five men through like that, all strike in unison. And you, you notice there's four wedges in there. Well, you've got to free a wedge every time, so you strike three. Two, three, and free that one. Well, then when that one's free, you take him out. You've got the weight mine on these. You put a, a small piece of iron up under there, which is called a rail. And it goes in so that the rail is there. It'd be further out than the others. So then you free the next one. And you free that, free that. That's how you do it. So you've lifted up perhaps 100, maybe more. Now that's L.B. Bush's quarry mine. That's the last quarry he worked in. XL, 8B, L.B. Bush. My father started about 1925 at uh, Wakeham and um, I started working with him straight after the war. That is called a toy bell and they used to put the lifting pit in with that. And when after they got the lifting pit in, they used to put the big wedges, which is always supplied by the local blacksmith. Of course, the eventual arrival of steam power and mechanization freed quarries of all constraints and enabled them to gorge inland, so removing field after historic field, giving the landscape we see today. Portlanders have made a living from the sea. 
fishing at Chesil Cove or Castletown or Church Oak need an intricate knowledge and respect of local waters. The sea around Portland Bill has long been regarded as one of the greatest navigational hazards in the channel. Tide and currents clash as they round the point, creating a treacherous race that can run at ten knots in spring tidal conditions. The Romans probably lit fires on Branscombe Hill to warn the sailors of the dangers, but lack of any local fuel would have meant these warning beacons would have been few and far between. Shipwrecks, the details were only recorded when there was severe loss of life. The rise in commercial shipping in local waters in the mid 17th century brought horrendous losses on Chesil Beach and around the bill. Portlanders gained a reputation as wreckers. This was in fact undeserved. Once the fate of a doomed vessel was clear, islanders lost no time in organising plunder. Smuggling too became a major industry. Caves and crevices, known only to locals, were ideal for concealment. And cottages all over the island were built or adapted to hide the contraband. Hidden rooms and passages are still found today. Operations were well organised in dimly lit back rooms of inns or cellars or lofts. And then you get down to where on Smith is now, the printer shop, where the groceries Mr Hansford, Mr and Mrs Hansford had that. And underneath their shop, believe it or not, was smugglers' tunnels, which I found. My aunt lived in 139 then days, and um, the back of her house, she went along a passage, and he went down three steps to the cellars one way, and up three steps to the bedrooms. Well, we used to go down the cellars and play, and that tunnel used to go right down to the King's Arms underground. Right until the mid-19th century, customs officers fought a hopeless battle against smuggling in the Portland area. The first lighthouse to be established on Portland was in 1716. In fact, two lighthouses were built, the higher light on Branscombe Hill and the lower light near the cliffs, a line so they would aid navigation by night and by day. Their operation was not a great success. Often they were not lit at all. So by 1788, Trinity House decided to take over responsibility by rebuilding the lower one and fitting revolutionary oil lamps was the first anywhere in the world to use a true lens. These lighthouses were eventually replaced in 1906 with a splendid new one. The lower light has become a renowned bird observatory, which ornithologists from all over the world use to this day. The higher lighthouse became a private residence, and then later a restaurant. Today, it has been carefully restored into executive holiday units. Over the years, Portlanders have enjoyed many happy customs and traditions. Cow Common Day on the 14th of May was probably the brightest. All the girls wore garlands and everyone went to watch the cattle turned out on the wide open commons all over the island. Today, there is the Gooseberry Fair, and locals delight in dressing up in traditional costumes. The annual Portland Fair in early November attracted crowds from far and wide. Until the late 19th century, there were sheep and cattle sales. But then the fair gave Portlanders their first experiences of electric light, freaks of nature, decadent recorded music, and even moving pictures. 
How many centuries ago this tradition started, we do not know. But since the 1860s, the event has been purely for fun, as the sheep and cattle sales diminished. Portland Fair still thrills the crowds and is an opportunity at the onset of winter for young people to meet and mingle. It was in the late 1790s that Portland started attracting more visitors, a spin-off from the soaring popularity of Weymouth, firmly put on the map by George III. The king regularly visited the island and took refreshment at the Portland Arms Fortune's Well, where he savoured Mrs Gibbs's puddings. Such culinary delights enticing him to return over the years. Victorian Portlanders love to tell the tale that the real reason the king visited that hostelry was a certain pretty young maid he met there, but we shall never know. An acquaintance of George III was John Penn, grandson of the founder of Pennsylvania, USA. Penn, who was seeking a site for his marine mansion, was captivated by the charms of Portland. What better location than the cliffs overlooking Church Oak Cove? He commissioned the foremost architect of the day, James Wyatt, and the superb Pennsylvania castle was opened by the king's daughter, Princess Elizabeth, in the year 1800. Penn spent the last 30 years of his life beautifying his estate, planting trees, and even introducing horse racing and red deer. The first place King George and other travellers encountered along the exposed causeway was Chisel, a truly ancient fishing village. But the houses were vulnerable to sea flooding, for they were built literally into the back slope of the Shingle Beach. From the mere, a near enclosed tidal lake, the Saltwater Creek extended well into the village itself. This has, over the centuries, become filled with silt and debris and is now under the main road. In 1824, devastation struck. A storm blew up in the English Channel, steadily rising to hurricane force. To cap it all, there was a spring tide. Gigantic breakers rose and broke over the beach, foaming water crashing over walls and rooftops. A third of Chisel's houses were destroyed, and 26 people lost their lives. Tales of the tragedy and the heroism of the rescuers aroused the sympathy of the nation. Relief funds came from all over the country. George IV himself sent 200 pounds to help the poor residents. For many years, trade and provisions between Portland and the mainland was entirely by sea barges or by the tenuous crossing at Smallmouth, a narrow but deceptively treacherous waterway at the mouth of the Fleet Lagoon. Smallmouth sands could sometimes be forded by horse and cart at calm low tide. But for many centuries, the main link was a rope-hauled ferry, at best a precarious crossing, and countless lives were lost. But it was a commercial lifeline and to all intents and purposes, Portland developed as a true island community, proudly distinct from mainland Britain. Repeated calls are made for a bridge across Ferry Passage, 
and eventually, in 1835, an Act of Parliament was passed allowing one to be built. Four years later, the first ferry bridge was opened. Life on Portland could never be the same. This new artery had ended for all time the isolation of an ancient island community. In 1895, the original long timber bridge was replaced by an iron one. This carried all the island's traffic, from horses to traction engines to modern juggernauts, right up until 1985, when this sleek structure was built partially on the site of the first one. The increasing demand for Portland stones through the 19th century called for constant innovation. The traditional method of drawing stone was hard and certainly cruel to horses. So in the 1820s, a group of local stone merchants got together to sponsor an act of parliament for a railway, the first in Dorset. This was not for steam locos, but it was a simple but ingeniously engineered line to take stone from the quarries near Priory down to the shipping piers in Portland Roads. The track was laid on a gently descending circuit around the slopes of Vern Hill to a point high above Castletown. There the horses were unhitched from the sturdy flatbed trucks, which were then hooked onto chains passing over a brake drum. The cable ran over rollers recessed in the ground, and the other end connected to empty trucks at the foot of the hill. By gravity, therefore, the heavy blocks of stone were lowered and the empty trucks drawn to the top. The stone was again horse-drawn to barges at Castletown Pier to be shipped to the Thames and other ports. So efficient was the merchant's railway that it continued to convey stone very profitably right up until the outbreak of the Second World War. Quarry masters of the last century, like Jonathan Combenleno, extended quarry engineering to new heights, building tunnels, small railways, cuttings and fine bridges, as we see here at Tout. It took some nerve to even think of building these bridges right at the brink of the cliff edge to carry trucks of stone waste for tipping onto the weirs far below. This is adding a new dimension to this area of Tout. We have the uh, wildlife interest, the historic interest with the quarry and the landscape, but it's adding art to, to the area. Sculptors come here from all over the world, in fact, to use the natural forms of the rock to work them into artistic forms, and it's uh, quite impressive. In the story of 19th century Portland, the name of one island leader recurs time and again, Captain Charles Augustus Manning. He was chairman for the commissioners for the building of Ferry Bridge, and in 1839, 
the same year that the bridge was opened, 3,000 people gathered in Fortuneswell to watch him lay the foundation stone for St John's Church, for which a platform had to be cut in the incredibly steep hillside. Like most properties under hill, it required a strong retaining wall back and front. However, until St John's was built, Church of England congregations had to walk to St George's, an inconvenient and exposed site above Reform. The church was designed and built by local architect Thomas Gilbert and completed in 1766. Fortunately, the magnificent St George's is now lovingly maintained as one of the most outstanding Georgian buildings in Dorset. About 20, 25 years ago, an elderly lady who turned to be 92 came to the church and asked if she could see if her hall was still there. And she explained that she was the daughter of the then rector of the island and sitting in the pew week after week, not being able to see anything, she borrowed her brother's penknife, bored the hall through the pew so that she could sit and watch her father preaching in the pulpit. To help fund the building of the church, the pews were sold to local families at a cost of £25 each. By the turn of this century, the heirs of these families had diminished. Very few people came to the services, as it was difficult to sit down without trespassing. And the church closed in 1917, when the new All Saints Church was erected near the heart of Easton. The Methodists were already well established on Portland, the island having been visited by founder Charles Wesley himself in 1746. I have two books here relating to the Wesleys. The smaller book of the two was presented to Anne Gibbs, but the larger one of the two was presented to Charles Wallace in 18. 41 for 50 years service with the church which meant when Mr. Brackenbury came to Portland in 1791 they were already a nucleus of Methodists here waiting to be led. But the movement well and truly took off when wealthy Methodist Robert Brackenbury arrived to show the islanders the light and built an impressive chapel near the top of Fortuneswell in 1792. No less than eight Methodist chapels were eventually built around the island, culminating in the attractive Brackenbury and Eastern Methodist churches, which were erected within nine years of each other in the early 1900s.